this is a terrible, uh, unspeakable act. Uh, I believe the American people will support, rally behind, and support the President of the United States. And I believe that we will find out who did this, and I think we will respond. And I don't know how you could describe it, very frankly, any other way but an act of war. You grew up in the conventional military, and we have such an investment in all of that. But for some time, national security officials across all administrations have been saying the great threat to this country is terrorism. Have we devoted enough attention to this kind of an act? Uh, it's very difficult for me to second guess. I think there's going to be plenty of, of that kind of activity. I, I would repeat that uh, when I talk to people in the field and when I travel around the world, our lack of human intelligence capability, part of that is the difficulty in penetrating some of these organizations. As, as you know, they're, they're very difficult, but uh, that may be an area that, that would have to be addressed. Uh, our technical capabilities, our satellites and others are are absolutely superb and sometimes uh, phenomenal but you've got to divine people's motives uh, as i said you've got to you've got to get these things before the act is being being carried out and that's probably an area that we have to look at but i i'm sure uh, that that this administration and the congress will will devote all their efforts to making sure not only that the people who perpetrated it are punished but also that uh, it never happens again Senator, is it too early to speculate on whether or not we're going to need protective air cover over the nation's capital in some of our more critical areas? I, I, I don't know. I, I do know that average citizens are going to find it a, a much more complicated process going to an airport and getting on onto an airplane. That'll be one of the first, obviously, one of the first and necessary evaluations that are needed because. I think it's pretty clear now that these planes were hijacked and how they were able to, to do that uh, in the case of at least four airplanes is, uh, is, is going to be a subject of great interest and, and perhaps some controversy because there's been this issue of security at airports for a long period of time. How much inconvenience versus how much security, which has been one of debate that's been in Congress and, and, and in other areas of government as well. So. Uh, I, I think that, that rather than attacking it from having air cover over the Capitol, perhaps we ought to devote our efforts to going places where this, uh, these acts of terror originate. That would probably be much more effective and cost-effective as well. Senator, uh, we're still dealing, as I say, with the in initial stages of shock, but in fact, it is hard to overstate the magnitude of all of this or the continuing effect that it will have on the business of this nation. Oh, I, I, I don't. There's never been anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a horrible and dastardly deed, uh, and I don't like to compare it to Pearl Harbor. But this, this is, this is unprecedented in its scope and, and frankly, its efficiency. Senator John McCain, thank you very much for being with thank us you, today. Tom. Thank you. Under these very difficult circumstances, it's also worth pointing out that in Pearl Harbor, it was a military attack on a military installation. This was an attack by terrorists using innocent American civilians, for the most part, in hijacked airliners directed at targets filled with civilians, with the exception of the Pentagon, obviously. Let's go to NBC's Robert Hager now for an update. Four planes hijacked today, Bob, two United, two American. Bring us up to date. With a total toll just in the airplanes, so thousands dead, presumably on the ground, but just in the airplanes, 266 dead. She said two American planes, two United planes. Uh, two of those planes were taking off from Boston, one from Newark, and one from Washington, Dulles. Uh, two went into the World Trade Center buildings, one went into the Pentagon, and one crashed in rural Pennsylvania with no idea where that one was being hijacked to. At last report, and this report was about... Uh, 40 minutes ago, there were still only, there were now only 50 planes left in the air, 50 commercial flights over domestic U.S. airspace. So that, that is saying no new flights were being allowed to take off, haven't since 9.30 Eastern time this morning. Uh, the planes that were already in the air were allowed to continue on. There were only 50 of those still in the air. Uh, they were mostly about 20 minutes away from airports, so presumably almost all of those should have landed by now. There were also 22 international flights still in the air heading here initially. The word was they were going to be diverted to Canada, and then the decision was made that that would be just too hard for Canadians to handle. And so those 22 flights were going to be allowed to land in the U.S. Uh, so far, we don't know of any of them landing. 
But this is a very important point. The FAA knew of no problems with any of those 50 planes still in the air in the U.S. or 22 in international airspace bound here. So that would seem to indicate that the problems are over in terms of these hijackings. Uh, just to run the flights down very quickly, uh, the first was an American airliner, Boston to Los Angeles. There were 92 killed on board that one. It went into the World Trade Center. That was the first event. Then there was a United plane leaving from Boston. Six Sixty-five were killed on it. It also went into the World Trade Center. It, too, as the American plane before it, was supposed to have been bound Boston to Los Angeles. Then there was an American airliner leaving from Dulles Airport bound for Los Angeles. Sixty-four aboard, and it crashed into the Pentagon. And finally, a United flight leaving Newark Airport bound for San Francisco. It went into rural Pennsylvania, so we don't know what its intended target was. Now, in ter terms of what Senator McCain was talking about, about when you think of a, of a plane being hijacked, you've got to get the hijackers aboard and you have to get some sort of deathly weapon aboard, like a gun or some explosives. And there are two ways to do that. Either they go through passenger screening and manage to sneak through passenger screening without getting caught, or you get behind the doors somehow and sneak those people aboard behind passenger screening as though they were an airport employee. Uh, there have been uh, investigations done uh, on both those things. The FAA tests them a lot uh, with plainclothes people to see if they get through, and every time they do it, a sizable percentage do get through passenger yep. screening with mock weapons or mock explosives. And the same thing on the, on the employees behind the lines. A sizable number do manage to get through the doors. So we'll be seeing in coming days uh, what it was that led to all this. Tom? Bob, any indication from the FAA of radio traffic indicating that there was a hijacking underway? No, what, what it is in the cockpit, uh, presuming that an armed person in the course of a hijacking, an armed person or somebody with explosives has broken into the cockpit, uh, the, the, and the pilot therefore cannot say it over the open radio because the hijacker uh, would take action against the pilot. So there's a button that you push. And the button sends out a code, and it tells the appropriate air traffic controllers, and word is flashed to Washington immediately, that there's a hijacking in progress. So one could presume that that happened in all four of these flights. Of course, we don't know at the moment, but it certainly must have. Then you wonder, too, uh, because the targets were hit so precisely, uh, is that somebody standing behind a pilot and saying, okay, now fly this right into a World Trade Center tower? Or is it an experienced pilot, the hijacker himself, who gets the pilot out of his seat and takes over at the controls to guide it in at the last minute? We don't know, of course. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Uh, NBC's Robert Hager, who will be monitoring the uh, airline part of all of this. The uh, four hijacked airliners, in effect, became guided missiles in the hands of terrorists who hijacked the plane. They took innocent people to death with them, 266 altogether. Uh, President Bush is at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana at this time. We're told other senior members of the Bush administration are in secure positions. There's code red at uh, the Capitol right now. House Speaker Dennis Hastert was removed to a secure position. All financial markets have been closed down. All national monuments have been evacuated. Across America, in places like Minneapolis, Kentucky, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, a number of critical installations have been closed down as well. This country, the most powerful in the world, has been, in effect, semi-immobilized today by these terrorist attacks. And we can only hope that they are now all over with. When we heard this morning at 8.42 that the World Trade Center had been attacked, we thought that that was a single, uh, a solitary and horrifying event. Not too long after that, the second one was hit. And then NBC Jim Ekleshevsky here on NBC said an explosion was felt at the Pentagon. And that was a plane that went into the Pentagon, another airliner near the hill it had there. It uh, fortunately was on the far side of the building from the most critical offices housing uh, the joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Intelligence Center. And of course, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, who at first did not want to evacuate the building. And then he was persuaded that that was in the best national interest of this country to do just that. And then, of course, we had uh, the situation. This is a News 4 special report.
We interrupt very briefly now with some important information for people in the local area. Mayor Williams has declared a state of emergency in the district. What that means is that you are asked, all non-essential people are asked to get off the streets, curtail your activities on the streets of Washington. Non-essential people means those other than police and fire and emergency personnel. And at this hour in Virginia, Governor Gilmore has also declared a state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that presumably means the same thing. Stay off of the uh, the streets. Uh, lots of people are headed home at this hour, still trying to uh, make their way home through the through the traffic created by all the closings. But uh, but in uh, in the district and in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a state of emergency. You are asked to go home and stay there. We return now to network coverage. Natural disasters. What did you have uh, in planning at FEMA for a terrorist attack? Well, of course, you know after the Oklahoma City bombing, Tom, we've worked very hard in putting together. A a uh, very strong federal response plan in which they have continued uh, to work on, particularly adding the uh, terrorist uh, component to that. And working with the FBI, uh, who will have the lead on this, is in crisis management. And of course, FEMA has a consequence management. And I'm sure Director Albaugh and uh, all the staff there are liaisoning with the FBI at this time. Uh, was that something that you prepared on your own, or did you do that in close coordination and get regular updates from the FBI? We uh, worked very closely with the FBI, and, and if there was a threat, uh, then the, they would uh, notify us and work very closely with them, and as, even for, as far as having someone in their operations center. When you look at those pictures of what happened in lower Manhattan in the canyons of this great city with those two 110-story buildings coming down, you can only imagine what the carnage must be on the ground. It, it's, it's probably horrifying. and. Uh, I saw earlier said it looked like a war zone, and I'm sure it does, and just looking at the pictures. But, you know, there's so many firefighters and police uh, officers that were probably up at the base of that building, probably in that building, trying to get people out. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, the loss is going to be tremendous and the uh, pain is going to be felt for a long, long time. Jimmy Lee, well, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, Afghanistan's ruling Taliban movement on Tuesday said that uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, they are closely allied with him, was not responsible for the attacks on the United States. What happened in the United States, according to the Taliban, was not a job of ordinary people. It could have been the work of governments. Osama bin Laden cannot do this kind of work. Neither can we, a Taliban spokesman said uh, from the southern city of Kandahar. The uh, Taliban, of course, a very militant and very conservative uh, Islamic organization and widely believed to be harboring Osama bin Laden, a very wealthy Saudi dissident who has a very sophisticated apparatus uh, at his disposal. Uh, he has not been seen for some time, although he does appear from uh, time to time on some Islamic uh, media outlets. Uh, one uh, reporter who has been in touch with him said that three weeks ago he said, uh, an attack was planned on the United States, but that, of course, has not yet been uh, verified. He is, at the moment, I think fair to say, at the top of everyone's list of suspects. But as we have learned on these occasions in times past, uh, it's often not the best thing to do to make a premature judgment. There is the picture that we have often seen of him as he has declared a holy war against the United States. Let's go to General Norman Schwarzkopf now, who had the Southern Command and, of course, commanded the forces during the uh, Persian Gulf War. General Schwarzkopf, I've been trying to review in my own mind the incidents in which the United States has been a conspicuous participant or absent in the past month or so. We lost a spy plane over southern Iraq. We've stepped up pressure on southern Iraq. Obviously, in the Middle East, in the, the, in the ongoing dispute between the Palestinians and the Israelis, there's a great feeling that the United States is siding only with the Israelis. The war in Sudan goes on, but we've not taken an active role there. Are there any other signs on your radar screen that would indicate uh, that this kind of thing was likely to happen? Well, you know, Tom, the truth of the matter is that most of the Middle East countries consider the United States to be, you know, the, 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 uh, the main source of support for, for Israel. It isn't, it isn't isolated just in certain states. And, uh, you know, any one of those people, if you got them aside and asked them truthfully, they would tell you that they were not in favor of our policies with regard to Israel. So do you think that that probably was the cause of all of this, this uh, continual escalation that has been going on between Palestine and Israel? And there's been an absence of participation, I think, that it's fair to say, on the part of this administration and all of that. 
Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that's kind of speculation at this time. I certainly think that, that uh, you know, the reason why the United States is hated in so many places in the Middle East is with regard to the support of the state of Israel. And as a matter of fact, they'll openly state that if Israel had not had the support of the United States, it wouldn't exist today. So they go so far as to say that. There are people, many, many people still trapped. When uh, you and I were talking earlier, we were commenting on the sophistication uh, of this attack and the complexity of that. Doesn't that stun you some? It, it really does. I mean, just, just what was mentioned by, you know, uh, by, by Robert Hager, the fact that uh, undoubtedly, uh, you know, I can't see any uh, U.S. commercial airline pilot flying their plane directly into an obstacle like that. Undoubtedly, there was, uh, you know, somebody at the controls that was able to guide the plane there. That, that in itself is kind of scary. I told you earlier about the fact that it bothers me that with all the devices we have against hijackers, that, that, that hijacking can still take place on this scale and, and, and organized in that fashion. Uh, that causes me concern. I certainly agree with what Senator McCain said about the fact that, you know, many, many years ago, uh, we abandoned human intelligence. Uh, uh, the attitude was that only bad guys have spies. And, and good guys don't need spies, and we put satellites in the air, and we put a huge amount of investment into technical intelligence. At the same time, we dismantled human intelligence. I don't know what the status of that is today, but, but, uh, but uh, we damn sure need to get somebody inside these organizations. Uh, I, I would tell you that... General, I'm just going to interrupt you for a moment because we're looking at some scenes that we have not yet uh, had an opportunity to see. It does look like a nuclear winter in lower Manhattan. It is one of the most vital areas anywhere in the world, obviously, the home of the financial markets, the World Trade Center, lots of residences. Uh, there's been a real revival down there in recent years, and it has a great gray pall of dust and smoke and debris. And of course, overlaying all that is the psychological effect of knowing that there could be a casualty list in terms of fatalities that could go into the thousands. Yeah. I mean, Pearl Harbor, we lost 2,400. And, uh, you know, when you hear the numbers today, it's hard to believe that we're not going to greatly exceed that number. And as I pointed out earlier, in Pearl Harbor, it was a military attacking a military installation. Um, this was the use of innocent people in uh, commercial airliners to attack other innocent people in New York. Uh, there was one military target, obviously, the Pentagon. You can see, if you're sharing, if you're looking at this with me, General, the extent of the damage in lower Manhattan. Yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, and, it, and you know, it's, the natural inclination is, okay, we've got to hit somebody back. And, and in this case, what's going to you know, be even more frustration to the national psyche is, is, is you can't hit back. You know, you don't, who, who are you going to hit at this stage of the game? Yep. Thank you very much, General Norman Schwarzkopf. We'll ask you to stand by. We'll be coming back to you. Uh, this is uh, as effective as a bomb being dropped there. There were two bombs in effect. Commercial airliners flown into those two buildings and they came down. We presume because of the initial explosion there may have been secondary explosions as well that were detonated in the building by these terrorists. Robert Harper was one of those who was uh, in the area when all of this occurred. Mr. Harper? Yes. Tom, how are you today? Well, tell me where you were when uh, the first plane flew into the first building. Um, I was down below the World Trade Centers. Um, I was uh, arriving at work just a little late, and um, we could uh, the bomb. The, the first plane had crashed into the building, so there were many people, you know, sort of standing around. There were EM, EMS uh, workers running around as well, and you could see the second plane coming around, and everyone sort of pointing up. And then that second plane just crashed into the building. And what about to people who were trying to get out of the building? We had one report of bodies falling through the air and people jumping from windows. Did you see any of that? Absolutely, absolutely. It was a very traumatic day, I think, um, having seen that, because where the initial explosion was, there was a lot of black smoke coming um, out of around, the, I believe it was around the 78th floor, and you saw people jumping for their lives um, out of the 78th floor of the World Trade Center. Um, smoke everywhere, fire everywhere, and people were continuing to jump out of the 78th floor, floor. so people began to run away because once the second explosion happened, um, the debris uh, that was caused by that began to fall everywhere, and everybody just started running toward the mayor's office, and I began to run toward the Woolworth building, which was close to that, and then as I got closer to that, I realized if, you know, the top of the World Trade Center hit the Woolworth building, that building, too, would be affected and it might also fall down. Did you have a sense right away that uh, these buildings could come down? 
Um, not initially, for about 15 minutes or so. People only thought, you know, they couldn't really tell what had happened. And only after the second plane hit did people realize that, you know, this is probably something that was orchestrated. Uh, and so then people initially who had, you know, been trying to go back to the scene and try to help people realize that another plane had hit the building. And that's when people said, look, this can't have been a mistake. Uh, where are you now? Um, I'm outside of the emergency room at Presbyterian Hospital. Um, I've just been released uh, for uh, smoke inhalation. I've been in the hospital there. They rushed me to the hospital um, you know, not too long after that because the black soot and everything that was associated with the building, I mean, heavy black smoke engulfed the entire financial district. Um, you know, any, from 9 o'clock onward, and um, we, we were so sitting on the side of the road. EMS workers were there um, administering um, oxygen to people, thinking that everything was okay. And then as they began to realize that the explosion might have caused so much trauma to both the World Trade Center that they would fall, then everybody just began to, ran, be began to run because they, they saw that the, the building itself was actually going to fall. So all of the people that had gone to help out were then put in, you know, double danger because you were then running, and the building literally literally came and fell, you know, in, over the entire, like, financial district area. It was a complete nightmare, black smoke everywhere. People were running toward the Brooklyn Bridge, running, you know, away from the mayor's office, afraid that the, the falling part of the World Trade Center would hit other buildings, and that would, you know, cause a topple effect. Thank you very much, Mr. Harper, and uh, thank God you're okay, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to deal with all of this. We do appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it's been a real mess, you know, and I can't, I, coming back in the ambulance, you know, somebody said, you know, one of the things that they remembered, you know, thinking about is the date today is September 11th, so 9-1-1. So, you know, it's something that can't really go without notice, is that this was completely planned, completely orchestrated. You know, whoever did this um, has been planning this, obviously, for a very long time. Thank you uh, very much, Robert Harper, who was one of the survivors who was uh, just a little bit late to work this morning, but then got caught in the uh, devastating attack on the Twin Trade Towers. Uh, they, it's, a, it's hard to, uh, for me to overstate to people who are unfamiliar with New York just how dynamic that area is in terms of people coming and going. The two uh, towers are 110 stories high, or they were. Uh, 20 to 50,000 people would work in them at any one time. It's uh, just a few blocks from the uh, stock market and from many of the principal banks in America to say nothing of residential areas. And we will not know for some time what the death toll is there to say nothing of the number of people who have been injured, so many of them with burns. Let's go to Washington now and NBC's Washington Bureau Chief Tim Russert. Tim, uh, give us the state of play in the nation's capital right now. We know that the White House and the State Department and CIA have been evacuated. Dennis Hastert has been removed. Where is Dick Cheney at this hour, do we know? Tom, he is in a secure location. They won't tell us exactly, but I do know that he is there with his top-level aides. Uh, we have heard from some of those people. Uh, he has been in constant communication with the President of the United States and the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice. Tom, I've been speaking to people in the intelligence and law enforcement community, in and out, those who have served, those who are serving now. No one is the least bit surprised that there was a terrorist attack on the shores of America. Every person, to a man and woman, absolutely stunned, not only by the magnitude, but by the precision of this attack. Uh, they are absolutely convinced that there's a, only a small, few cells that could possibly have done this. And this is quite interesting because I didn't realize it until it was pointed out to me. Every one of the four hijacked planes that Bob Hager talked to you about was bound for California. In the words of this high-ranking official, the bastards knew they all had a plane full of fuel for the maximum impact upon collision. There is, in my experience in Washington, unprecedented anger here, but no one knows how or where to channel it. Right now, it, the situation is a bit chaotic. Communication is difficult, but the Bush administration is underscoring that the president is in charge, in command, in constant communication, and will bring these people to justice. They just know it's going to take a long, long time. Tim, it's also going to be a test of the political maturity, if you will, of Washington. It's a city that has been so riven by what many would describe as petty political disputes. But this is one nation on this day. Suddenly, the Social Security lockbox seems so trivial, Tom. One official said to me, Tim, your life is going to change. But more important, your son's life is going to change forever. America will never be the same after September 11, 2001. The levels of security, heightened tension, uh, the way we look at each other and look at our institutions uh, will, in fact, be altered. 
uh, that will bring uh, some gratitude, if you will, to the terrorists. And that's why we as a nation, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, are, as they talk with one another today, are absolutely unified in their attempt to strike back, but also try to put salve on the national psyche so we don't become an armed camp resisting an enemy we really can't identify and never know when it's striking. Because the consequences psychologically for this country are every bit as great as they are physically for America as well. It is worth pointing out, I suppose, that we all breathed a great sigh of relief when the Cold War came to an end with the collapse of communism. And yet there was nothing as devastating as this for this country during that long, cold twilight that we faced down communism in Moscow with its considerable nuclear arsenal, which it still has in place, obviously. You know, Tom, it's a very important point because all during this past few weeks, the debate about missile defense systems, uh, many people were saying publicly, even those proponents or the detractors, well, you know, we're, we're a long way from research on this, but there is a potential threat of a rogue nation launching a missile or an accidental launch from Russia or China modernizing, modernizing force, modernizing their force. But, but everyone kept saying the true risk, the real risk is terrorist attack and we plain don't know how to defend ourselves. But again, and let me underscore this, people are absolutely stunned, disbelieving that something so well coordinated, something is with a tick-tock like this, four hijackings within a matter of an hour, and then being able to take those very planes and drive them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and there is growing suspicion, Tom, here, that the plane that landed, it crashed in Pennsylvania, was most likely headed for the Capitol or White House. That's the operating theory of many of the people I've spoken to today. Thank you very much, uh, NBC's Tim Russert. Uh, the equation has changed for all of us personally and professionally in the course of the last several hours, and we'll be dealing with this for a, a long, long time. But first, we want to take you through the eyewitness accounts of people who were witness to what happened here on a very sunny early fall morning in New York today, some of the eyewitnesses. I spent the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Boy, a lot of people died. Nothing is devastating. We carried a bunch of people that we found laying in the debris. It was complete darkness. We stumbled over some people. We picked them up and carried them across the street. You could hear the rumbling when you looked up. You could see the top of the building just pounded. Then there was the haunting story from an eyewitness that we heard from a few moments ago of people in wheelchairs who were unable to get out of the building as he ran down the stairs, and he was obviously overcome with emotion as he described that for us. Uh, we don't have any numbers for you. Uh, we're trying to be as circumspect as we can be. All public officials are saying that they expect the final death toll to be horrendous, but this business of determining how many people are still in the rubble will take many, many hours, if not days, to determine. Here is a quick summary of what we have been through today in this country on the 11th of September, the year 2001. At 8.42 this morning, first one plane that had been hijacked crashed into the World Trade Center. Then, not too long after that, a second plane. About an hour later, the Pentagon was attacked by a hijacked airliner, and then came word that another hijacked airliner had crashed outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, when we saw the first reports and witnessed, those of us who live in New York, of the World Trade Center being a, hit by an airplane, at first all of us thought, I'm sure, that it had to be some kind of a terrible accident. And then when we heard that a second plane, and you could see it flown deliberately into the uh, World Trade Center, the horror of this terrorist war began to unfold, and it continues to unfold here uh, now almost five hours later. And we'll be continuing to cover this uh, across America and in the nation's capital. NBC's Pat Dawson has been not too far from the World Trade Center throughout most of the day, where it has been chaotic and terrifying. Pat? Tom, as you uh, point out, we try not to exaggerate uh, very much in this circumstance, and yet in many ways it's hard not to exaggerate just the things we have been seen and the things that we have been told. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the task that now confronts rescue workers here is Herculean. 
a very, very difficult task, and it is of two parts. It has been about three hours since what we might call the last catastrophic incident in a morning of catastrophes. Uh, that is since the North Tower of the World Trade Center, which used to stand behind me just about 10 blocks south, right below there. It used to tower above the buildings, which you can see, and obviously it is no longer there, nor is the South Tower. Three and a half hours since that happened, there have been enough catastrophic incidents since then, but it has affected the rescue effort clearly because they are afraid of what could happen, what still might happen since there were a sequence of catastrophes, if you will. That has made the rescue very, very difficult. At this point, we are being told unofficially that there may be as many as two to 300 rescue workers who are actually down there. We have seen pictures of some of them. They are down around the base of this building. They are beginning the, again, to use that word, Herculean task of trying to find the people who might be alive in that debris. We know that there are a great number of people who are dead in there, unquestionably. What they are hoping to find is survivors, and at this point, they really can't speculate on how many there are, how many there could be, and I don't think it really serves us at this point to speculate on the numbers that it could be. Uh, one of the tasks, though, is to try to get this rescue effort in its entirety going, and as you can see behind me down here, there are probably hundreds of New York City uh, and New York State and federal rescue people who are involved, fire, police, emergency service, quite a few. In addition to those, the task is, uh, is certainly aided by the American Red Cross's disaster relief teams. They are here on the scene. This is Frank Donahue, who is with the American uh, Red Cross. Uh, Frank, tell me first of all, as you start out here, what is it you're trying to do? Well, our immediate, our immediate uh, purpose is to kind of assess what role the Red Cross can play initially, and certainly it's to help the emergency medical people that are here provide any kind of relief and support we can for them. People being evacuated from neighborhoods need a place to go, and the Red Cross is setting up service centers and shelters. There's one at Grand Central Station and Penn Station. Um, and then the blood supply, making sure we have a safe blood supply, not only here, but throughout the country. Do you have any idea, have you heard, how many casualties have been dealt with so far? No, I have not. I'm sorry. I have not heard that. Is it, if, now, part of your task, though, is also to provide blood supplies. Obviously, that will be needed in Houston. Absolutely. Houston. And people throughout the country are responding. They should call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. It's important to know that this incident, and, and you know, there's blood needed here in Altoona, there's blood needed all throughout the country that's been affected by this disaster. Mm -hmm. Another part is people that are, are, tra are moving around, are, are traveling today. No airport in this country is open. And so Red Cross volunteers are in every airport providing assistance to families. Families are calling the Red Cross here in New York as they are calling their local Red Cross to try to communicate and find the well-being of people that were in this building as well as people. Um, in the other affected areas. So you were also telling me about grief counseling uh, and, and dealing with people who've been traumatized around the country, maybe at other airports. Absolutely. Boston, for example, LAX, where those airplanes were uh, coming from and headed to, we have Red Cross mental health worker volunteers there that are providing assistance to families. Um, and again, that's happening throughout the country where people have been affected by this disaster. Uh, here in New York alone, the Greater New York Red Cross has had lots of experience at the World Trade Center a number of years ago. Today, there's about 1,200 local Red Cross volunteers here in New York providing food and shelter direction and support to people that are incredibly affected by this incident. And how many Red Cross workers do you think around the country? Oh, a number of thousand, a couple thousand for sure. I know in Philadelphia where I came from, we're on standby working with emergency management. It's the same thing in every major metropolitan area that Red Cross workers okay. work closely with emergency management. Frank, I thank you so much for Thanks taking some time out. We appreciate it. That was Frank Donahue of the American Red Cross. Tom, that brings you uh, pretty much as much information as we have here in what remains a fairly chaotic situation. Tom? All right, thanks very much, uh, NBC's Pat Dawson. As the uh, shock begins to wear down, we're going to all, all of us are going to be have our patients tested as well as we await uh, these reports. We'll try to deal with it as factually as we possibly can. It does now appear that the wave of attacks is over. We could not be certain of that just a few hours ago as there were these reports of planes that were still in the air, some that had been hijacked, and their destinations were uncertain at, at that time. This is a live picture of Lower Manhattan, missing one of its two of its most familiar profiles, obviously. The twin trade towers of the World Trade Center, uh, iconic buildings here in New York, uh, really representing, symbolic, if you will, of the enormous economic strength of this country. Uh, they sustained an attack in 1993. They were reopened. The country came back from that. And we went about uh, our merry way again, thinking that in Fortress America, this 
couldn't possibly happen. But of course it has. Neil Livingston is uh, one of the most widely recognized on experts on international terrorism. Mr. Livingston, we keep coming back to the same issue. This was a very sophisticated attack. This was not just a lone suicide bomber of some kind. Four hijacking simultaneously. Obviously someone in the cockpit who knew how to get the plane to the targets that they wanted to get them to. And it hap had had to have happened over a long period of time and they were all transcontinental flights loaded with fuel. Tom, this is our worst case nightmare scenario, the one that we've hoped would never happen, and that would be a, a multiplicity of targets with a multiplicity of uh, uh, highly sophisticated bombs, uh, in this case aircraft, uh, and, and uh, very symbolic targets. And so this, a great deal of thought went into this, a great deal of time and money. Uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so we can anticipate that maybe uh, uh, a year or more was uh, probably devoted to planning this attack, and uh, there may be others coming. Uh, Mr. Livingston, I remember that the FBI has been concerned for some time about the number of cells uh, harboring terrorists in America that have been growing. Is that true? Well, there clearly are a number of people in the United States that have been the beneficiaries of our of our uh, relatively liberal immigration policy that have hidden within various communities here and uh, have very uh, expressed very strong anti-American sentiments. Whether that can be translated into terrorism at this point is is uh, is open to question. I would suspect that what we will see in this case are are perhaps foreign nationals who have arrived in the United States strictly to carry out this mission, hijack these aircrafts and take them to their, uh, to their targets. Uh, very similar to what we saw in that millennial uh, potential attack when, uh, when a man was arrested at uh, the border in Washington state who was going to carry out bombing attacks in the United States. He was an outsider who had been sent here to do that. All right, Neil Livingston, thank you very much. I also have on the phone now uh, Anthony Lake, Tony Lake, a former national security advisor to President Clinton, who has been a longtime student of the prospect of terrorism in this country recently wrote a riveting fictional account of the various scenarios that the United States may have to deal with. But even in your most wildest imaginative days, Tony, you could not have anticipated something like this. No, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, it's hard to say you can be lucky in any respect in something in, in such a catastrophe. But one of the great dangers still lurking out there is that it could have involved some kind of weapon of mass destruction. But at the same time, uh, it's hard to understate the amount of damage that has been done here physically and certainly in terms of loss of life. When you have an institution like the Pentagon attack, the World Trade Center's attacked, and the plane that went to Pittsburgh might have been headed for the Capitol or the White House. For yes. No, this is terrible. A, a, as I said, a catastrophe. Clearly a very sophisticated terrorist attack. Uh, the, our intelligence community has headed off some in the past year or two. Uh, their ability to evade our usual intelligence gathering methods in order to pull this off is extraordinary. And, and one question now we need to focus on is not only why did this happen, but where do we go from here? Well, short term, if you were the national security advisor now back in your old office in the White House, what would be your recommendations in terms of a suppression of some of our normal liberties that we have in this country? Well, we mustn't defeat our liberties in there uh, in trying to defend them. I think what I would be uh, urging now is, first of all, of course, uh, get all the information we can immediately while dealing with the uh, human dimensions of this catastrophe. And then thinking ahead, uh, I think there are three fronts we have to act on. One, there must be, once we have identified the source of this, we must, there must be an American uh, response to this of some kind. Uh, secondly, I hope that this will uh, encourage us to even think in new ways about the nature of our security threats and increase our preparations, for example, for the Coast Guard in defending our ports against uh, possible incidents like this, uh, customs, the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service, and improving our organizations, uh, our organization for uh, dealing with catastrophes like that. Uh, there, there's been progress on all these fronts, but uh, not enough. And finally, and I think this is very important, we need to recognize that there is only one group out there that is trying to kill Americans, and that are these terrorists. We are at war with them, and it is not enough for us to attack simply on an American basis. We need to develop a global strategy 
for a global alliance, for a global war uh, against these terrorists, including, for example, making sure that any nation pays a terrible price when it provides sanctuary for terrorists. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony uh, Lake, uh, former National Security Advisor to uh, President Clinton, now an author and professor uh, uh, here in uh, the eastern part of the United States. We were just told that uh, the uh, British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has stopped all civil flights over Great Britain, whether that was precautionary or in response to a threat that his government received. Uh, we cannot say that all flights there have been uh, canceled. Let's just take you through now a quick summary that uh, does not begin to tell the true story of this day, but it is a kind of a checklist of what we've been through. Four airliners, two American, two United, headed for California from Washington and Boston, were hijacked, two flown into the World Trade Center here in New York, one into the Pentagon, one crashed outside of Pittsburgh. The World Trade Center, two 110-story buildings collapsed completely in lower Manhattan. Uh, we're showing you Somerset County, the airport near Pittsburgh, where the other United plane went down. All of this happened in the eastern seaboard, but that's just the geographical connection. This is a wound on America wherever you live, whatever your ideology may happen to be, uh, unless you are in sympathy with the terrorist beliefs. And when those two twin tra trade towers went down, of course, that caused even more damage uh, to lower Manhattan. Uh, at the same time, the Pentagon was attacked by one of the hijacked airliners, a number of dead in the Pentagon as well, in the outer rings, first and second rings near the helipad there. President Bush was diverted from Florida to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We're told that Vice President Cheney is in a secure position. We don't know exactly where that is. The third in the line of succession is the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert. He was told there's a code red, and he was taken to a secure position as well. Uh, all financial markets have been closed down. Hospitals in New York City are overtaxed. The world's largest, busiest city is at the moment uh, all but shut down with tunnels in and out of the city that have been closed for security reasons, traffic off the streets. 30 Rockefeller Plaza, where we work, and other midtown high-rise buildings have been evacuated for this day. All the subways are closed down.